Welcome to the Showgirl Tip of the Day podcast. As we get into the holiday season, I feel like it's my showgirl duty to advise you, invite you to shop secondhand. I hope you do that because there's a lot of us vintage dealers out there and we sell secondhand items. One of the people that I've had season one, Kari from Carnet Creative guest, I want to have her back because she's had a lot of new things happen in her life since we spoke and I want to catch up with her. (laughs) How are you? I am good. How are you doing? Oh, my goodness. So many things have happened since I last spoke with you. And I want to hear all about what you're up to. You have a website now. Tell me about this. Yes. So I launched the website, I guess, June of 2021. And I had the website before, but I didn't have the product listed specifically. It was just kind of like a landing page to transfer people to my Poshmark, Depop, or eBay and Etsy because I think I was on Etsy at the time. But this was a great way for me. I built the website and had it linked with Shopify and Facebook. So a very exciting thing for me was to be able to post a photo and then tag the product. So whoever was seeing the product or the photo would be able to shop directly and then fortunately not as many fees on my end. So that was very, very exciting for me. And it also took a lot of legwork and sometimes people don't always want to reach out through DMs and ask about something they can see all the details about the item and purchase it directly on there. Now, do you still have your storeroom that you use as a showroom and store? Yes. So I still have it's about 600 square feet. So it's small but mighty. And I've gone it's I think I got it. I guess it was January or or, yes, I think January and it's been two years that I've had it. Wow. Um, Yeah. How is the rent? It's good. It's good. It's actually very affordable because I am tucked back in actually it's a trucking depot officially. So I'm amongst, you know, 16 wheelers all day, but the space was totally renovated by my dad two years, I guess, two years prior to me moving in. So I was super excited about the space. So when it came available, I jumped right on it and I've been there since, but I run all my online listings are stored there. I do all my photography shipping, and I still do private appointment shopping appointments. There's about six racks in there, all my jewelry, accessories, everything that I don't have all the time to list online. And I tote around to markets is there and shoppable as well. Let's talk about the markets for a minute. So how many and because COVID seems to be better, is it? And yes. the, I remember you had some markets canceled a couple of years ago. How has the pandemic helped you lately? Like it seems to be things are working again. Yeah. Yeah. You would. It, I mean, there's still definitely not the crowds that you would see prior, but I did markets so low. I started in 2020. So it was just at the height of the pandemic was when I started. And honestly, that was one of my like best markets ever. I think after coming off of months, it was in October of 2020, months of not seeing or talking or shopping anything. I mean, even like, obviously thrift stores were closed. So it was a huge opportunity for people to get out, be social, safe safely and and shop. But now I've done markets pretty much every weekend. And it's, it's crazy. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of socialization and a lot of physical labor packed into, you know, 12 to 15 hours. And I do really enjoy it. I'm now getting to the end of the fall season. So it gives me a chance to kind of take a step back and reevaluate where I'm putting my time and how successful it really was. I really, when I'm lugging around stuff, I think about you and I'm like, let's go, let's go girls. <laughs> you know, you know, the beginning of that song, you, you know, I've been doing the vault in Winthrop. Yes. Kari, what 2022, what are the trends that you're seeing in the Westchester PA area? What are the trends of vintage selling? And do you find that online sales are up 
Are they down? And do you have to work so hard to make a balance of your shows, your booths that you have and your showroom? So I know when I spoke to you the first season, you were working crazy long days. Is it still that way? Are you making money? Are you supporting yourself? I just want to know all the things. (laughs) Get the full scoop. Okay. Well, I'll start with the trends. I think for me, I don't do too many markets in the Westchester area. I branch out to the main line, which is like the suburbs just outside of Philadelphia. And then I do a lot of markets in Philly, which I feel like is our little epicenter of fashion. It is so cool to see doing markets in Philly. It's like an absolute frenzy of young people just loving everything funky, cool, has a story. And Y2K, year 2000 and 90s fashion is like their bread and butter. They love everything tacky, ugly, cool. It's just low rise jeans everywhere, you know, tiny little shoulder bags. It's the things that sometimes I'm hesitant to be like, is this too new? And you know, you you struggle because I was very much like in a purist vintage background. And, you know, people turn their nose up, but even 80s fashion, but it is always amazing to me, you know, the enthusiasm that's met with these things that I'm like, you know what, I think this is cool, I'm gonna pick it up. And then someone just like, I had a, a customer see me at another market, and they had bought for me at my previous market. And they were like, I just have to stop you because I bought a blazer. She's like, you probably don't remember. And I was like, no, it's the camel like Liz Claiborne. And she was like, it changed my life. She's like, that blazer changed my life. I wear it with everything, gives me so much confidence. And I was just like, okay, those are those like, ah, okay, this is why I do it. This is what I love. This is what's so exciting, like to see the passion that I find in the item it lives on with the next person and it's met with that. So I really, that, yeah, it's just a very exciting thing to do consistent markets and to consistently build like a, um, a really great customer base um, Mm -hmm. and see them come back and see them want to tell me how excited they are about the item that they bought. Um, The right, the right piece of your wardrobe can make you feel so incredible incredible. And you you just said that really well. And I love that you made somebody else feel the way we feel when we find something because it's like a high. It's like when you find that piece, you're like, oh my goodness. And sometimes you find it in the most random places. This is, I just found a piece of gold. This is phenomenal. It's always exciting because at this point now I have a lot of people that do bring me halls of inventory and they're always like, you always surprise me what you pick out. I'm not quite sure you're going to like this. And then I'm like, that's my favorite piece in the whole hall. Like I can't wait for this. So, you know, sometimes you're, it's very, (laughs) it does happen where you pick out something you're like, this is going to be a hot ticket item. And then it just does not get picked up. It doesn't have the excitement that you thought it would have, but it's always exciting when you, when you find that fit where someone's like, no, I need this. I can't leave without this. Yeah. What, what do you sell more online or in person? At this point, I'm selling more in person just because that's where I'm spending the most of my time. I, at a, at any given point had about 500 items listed on four different platforms and now I'm, I'm at about 390. And that just shows like I am bringing some of my online inventory to markets as well and selling through that at a faster rate because people are able to touch the item, interact with it, try it on, see if it fits, where online it can be harder. And you're also just fighting with abundance as well. And, you know, you're under one category and there's, you know, 90 decades that you're fighting with and, you know, thousands and thousands of sellers. So it's definitely easier at this point for me to engage a customer face to face than to grab their attention online. But I definitely still see the value online. If not more, I'm focusing more now in the next year of my social media buying and selling because that is a great way for me to also, you know, I have the customer at the market. They see my Instagram. They're continuously seeing what markets I'm at, what I have. Oh, look, she has this belt. I really want this. Let me DM her. And that kind of continues the 
customer relationship beyond that. So I do see the importance of definitely being online and I have no plans of doing otherwise. I really like the hybrid model of doing both. That's good. What's your day? Has your day gotten any easier? Because I know you were pulling 16 hour days. Has your lifestyle changed? Are you like, for me with the vintage selling, I don't want my house to be cluttered with, and as I say this, I have three big garbage bags <laughs> right to my right, Yeah, but I'm going to sort it, organize it and put it away. I, the fact, like, I love organized. I pulled all my holiday stuff that I've been collecting, but you have the storeroom. So that helps. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll pick up on that question. But yeah, I think having the space separate, I did move to, I downsized. I was running the business out of a three bedroom twin home and I had the basement. I had upstairs and my closet, which was the third bedroom. And I had roommates. I had my dad that was living um, and we were living together. Together, but I downsized to a one bedroom apartment. And that space, I mean, where I am is, is, for the most part, other than laundry, it is business free. I do, you know, work remotely from here. But it has been a huge physical and like mental load to have a space to come back and not necessarily bring the physical work with me. My new endeavor is to clear out the back room of my showroom and make that a laundry room. So I'm not bringing even the laundry back here, but it's definitely a good space to have. I think also it was a huge game changer for me to have the showroom when I did to physically like leave and go to a space that was just work mode because that can be hard. I was, you know, starting the day waking up and going downstairs to work and, you know, not even like brushing my teeth some mornings and I would, you know, go back and like, be like, okay, now I need to get ready for the day. And that can kind of, you know, being a solo business owner, entrepreneur, there is definitely a grind mentality. And it's not even, I think, like a mentality at this point, like it's a necessity. I have to be on and I have to work these crazy hours. And obviously you wouldn't do it if you didn't like it. You didn't see the passion for it, but it's not a forever model. Like you can't function like this forever. So I'm getting to the point now where I will budget like an afternoon or a morning time slot where I take a chunk of time off. I never take a full day because at some point you're always answering messages, checking things, shipping things, you know, responding to DM, posting on Instagram. So it will never be a full day off, but I've been better at taking like a time slot where I'm like, okay, this is time to like rest, recharge. So yeah. But I love like talk about this with you forever because we yeah. both are so jazzed up about it. We are. And how how lucky to find something that we like to do. And it is work, but there are moments like, I don't know about you, but I listen to people's podcasts while I'm like folding things and pricing and tax. And it's just like a happy place. I'm like, oh, yeah, like this is cool. I what I want to do is develop some of my own clothing, like I'm working on a sweatshirt design. And I do know that even producing something like that, there are great costs involved. So my biggest challenge is keeping my cost of goods very low so I can make a little bit of money. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking into selling to maybe a more upscale customer who is willing to pay a little bit more because the customers I've had so far are, you know, great, fantastic, but the price point at the vault up in Maine has been on the low side. And I've had some 80s prom gowns that I sold to other dealers. And I know that they're going to turn around and resell them for a lot more than what I sold them for, but that's okay. I mean, I learn with every month I'm in this business, I learn and I hopefully grow, but I definitely have a customer avatar and my customer avatar is someone that is a younger version of myself in a way, but also willing to spend a little bit of money on themselves and to be someone who is still in that mode of, I want to look fabulous. 
Yeah, it can be hard. I think we're also gaining momentum going into quote unquote a recession. So it can, it's definitely, you know, moments of fear of, you know, my customer is seeing the value in secondhand clothing. They're doing it because it's unique, but they're also doing it because it can be super cost effective. They come in with the mentality that you bought this for so low and are selling it to me for a, such a substantial profit. So I'm going to talk you down. And this is not all the customers, but it is a common ideal that you bought this so low, you're making such a profit off of it. Where, you know, when you're suggesting with the wholesale industry and getting into production, there is a substantial cost, but that co- that that cost is coming for an item that is brand new, ready to sell. My item has been in an attic for 30 years <laughs> with moths and whatever else. So I have to take it, you know, we have to soak it and make sure that it's all properly with the right laundry detergent, spot treatment. It has to be like dry, air dried. It has to have the right steam on it. Might need a stitch or two. It has to be photographed. We need to buy tags. We need to buy business cards. We need to buy a booth fee. You know, we could go 10 pages long of all the extra costs that come with the item. And that can be really hard to see when you're just staring at an object on a hanger. I want to in a parking lot. (laughs) Yeah. So this, I was at the vault this last month and a customer tried, it wasn't my booth, but a customer tried to really lower the price of an item that I thought was priced really fairly. And we are allowed to do a 10% discount. But what this woman was asking for was was like a 30% discount. And I just was like, no, because every single vendor... Every single vendor at the bo- at the vault knows their market, and the item that she wanted was priced one hundred percent fairly. You know, and I get that too with people, and I just say I'll give you ten percent off, but I'm not going to give away the items that I found and sourced. And time is money, and we've invested a lot of time into our stuff. Yeah. I have a, I was writing down, I had a market the other day and I was writing down quotes that customers have told me because I always feel okay. like sometimes you store stuff and you forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. But I had the customer, it was market opened at 10 AM. They were right there and they love this top and she's looking at it and she's like, well, when you buy an expensive item first off and you can't buy anything else and I don't want to get carried away and buy this, but I really love it. So I'm going to think about it. So I'm like, I can't have price. I couldn't have priced this top so high. Like, I don't know what I was. It was $18. Okay. So she's in the booth talking to me, looking around. As soon as she puts it back on the rack, another customer grabs it. The customer is dilly dallying. She walks out of the booth. Customer buys the top that the other customer is just looking at and walks, starts to walk out. And the woman's like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to buy the top. And the top had just been sold. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. It just sold. And she was going to start to get, she could tell. She was like, well, I can't believe that. And she put it on the rack. She didn't ask to hold it. Obviously, I can't. It's a one of a kind item. And, you know, everybody's budget's different. It's not to shame that. But it was also like, you know, it's such an expensive item. It's an $18 top. But, you know, and that was kind of those moments where you're like, okay, this was priced correctly. This was a fair whatever. But it was just one of the moments where you're like, well, sorry, as soon as you lose, like that's the way the cookie crumbles. But it's just funny, you know, what people will say in the moment. And no, that's what yeah. I- and, and I always feel like if an item's like over a hundred dollars, then you might have to think about it. But an $18 top that probably originally retailed for like 70 or something like just buy it, you know, but I do understand people are on a budget. I, one thing I've stopped doing for my own self is I've stopped shopping retail. I used to always go to the stores. I don't do that anymore because I know if I go to the store, I'm going to see something I want. So I just don't go anymore. Yeah. And I have a I have a laundry list of things I want to do to fix up my place, but I tick the list off one at a time because I just am on a really tight budget lately. And I'm like, nope, nope, you don't need everything. So if I need curtain rods, I'm going to get like one set or maybe one window at a time, slowly, slowly, slowly get my stuff done. But gone are the days when 
I mean, I used to spend money like Diamond Lil. I was, and the Manhattan Vintage show, like, I, I now look at myself, I'm like, oh my God, I, I think I blew like 500 bucks once at the Manhattan Vintage show. Easy to do, right? Yeah, that's nothing for, you know, some people will go in there and it's very easy, especially in the culture of that is you're seeing other people and you can so easily be influenced into, especially with the frenzy. Like, I have to get this. I have to get this. Nobody else get this. We're like, you know, in a normal thing, like you said, you're making a list. You're going to, do I need this? How do I buy this in the most effective way? And like, that's truly what secondhand shopping and vintage ideally would be is you have, you know, the kids call it now the thrift list and they have their thrift list on their notes app and their phone. So when they're at the thrift store, they're not over or over buying in excess what they don't think they need. They're going according to their list. So I need to take some notes from the younger generation. <laughs> I know. I love these kids. They're making yeah. me happy. They're the best. Um, so any goals for 2023? You said social media. Yes. Social media. I am looking into having some interns for the hopefully holiday season. I've put some feelers out. I need to, you know, get that set. And um, hopefully in the spring, I'm looking to get into more shops and having like a small space, a pop-up rack, something that is a little bit more permanent than a one-day market. Mm -hmm. And I am, you know, the original goal and I've talked to, I'm pretty sure I've probably mentioned in the last episode, the whole goal was when I started Carnet Creative was to be more of an upcycled, get creative with my embroidery, my sewing, my recreation, pattern making, all these things were, that were initially a passion for me and what drove me to start in a degree in fashion design. And, you know, I just was met with the abundance of vintage and mm -hmm. already really wanted wonderful clothing, but I have a serious stockpile of linens and flawed vintage that has been screaming my name. And now we're five years into selling online. Wow. Five years. No, oh, five years of just celebrating in September. And it'll be three years full time in April of 2023. So I need to get my act together and start putting my creative process as a priority. So that's definitely the top of my goals. So in 2023, can you and I do a pop up at some point? Do you yes. want to do a pop up together? Well, we need to collaborate, Michelle. Yes, absolutely. I think, yeah, I love. So I don't know if you saw online, but I collected vintage handkerchiefs and I made a couple of dresses. Yeah. So taking the train into Manhattan, I'd always feel very anxious just sitting there for a while. I would read for a while. I would watch movies. But what really kept me calm is hand sewing. Yeah. And it, my train ride is an hour and so I would, you know, I get on the train, take out my sewing, and then all of a sudden I would be at Grand Central Station. So I want to continue that. I don't know if I would ever sell those items. I guess I could. Yeah. But right now I'm just making them for me and for my own. The handkerchief dress that I finished is I'm so proud of it. It's so beautiful and it's one of a kind. It's it's hard because I started doing like a prototypes. I was going to like show my mentor at the time, the collection that I prepped, I did the full business plan, the mood board, everything, started creating the pieces. And I just totally chickened out because I wanted everything to be perfect. It had to be everything. Absolutely. And the whole point of those pieces that they aren't perfect. That's why you're making them because they're all messed up or they might have stains or they might have holes and you're recreating it to be something that's original. I do get that in my head. It's very easy for me to like chicken out of what I'm doing because I don't feel like it's absolutely perfect and not presentable. So I definitely understand where you're like, oh, I don't know if I would sell them. I don't know or blah, blah, blah. And like, it's definitely like, I'm like, I'm telling you because I'm also telling me like, go for it. You do it. Like you're going to get compliments on it. So people will want it. I'm so glad to talk to you. And I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Any things you want to tell the audience who, by the way, everybody loved your first episode. That's why I wanted to have you back. I wanted to touch base with you and see what was up. So do you have any last thoughts for the audience? Yeah. I mean, I first off want to thank you. You know, your connection and your friendship is such a light for me. I so appreciate your support. 
short. And for everyone on the podcast listening, I am so glad that I got to come back for part two. And, you know, you can keep up with me on Instagram and Facebook at Carnet Creative. My website's CarnetCreative.com. It's K-R-N-E-T. And then that is karma with the life cycle that things come back around just like vintage and planet merged. So that's a little bit about my name. And I just hope that, you know, if you are new to secondhand clothing, new to vintage, that you'll give it a try. Feel free to shoot me a DM. I love talking with you. And I'm just excited to see what's next. And I know, like, I just can't thank you all for following along and supporting me. Hooray! All right. The Showgirl Tip of the Day podcast has original music composed by Joshua Holloway. Find him on YouTube, Joshua Holloway Music. This podcast is written by Michelle Bruckner and edited by Michelle Bruckner and Joshua Holloway. Find me on Instagram, Showgirl Tip of Day. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next week with a new episode.